Yes. So, welcome everybody to the twelfth session of the of the Gone Two webinar series. So, my name is, is Boris Dewitt from uh, Cervasa in Chile, and I will be moderating uh, today's session. So, uh, the World Gone Two uh, team is very happy to have you uh, to this uh, to, to this uh, webinar, and we have uh, today two two incredible speakers. Uh, <clears throat> that will be uh, presenting their latest uh, science. Um, but first, um, let me give you some housekeeping uh, uh, announcements. So as an uh, attendee, you have the possibility to type your questions in the question box. And the chat can be used also to share additional information and if, if you have any logistical problems. So let's start now. We, as I, as I mentioned, we have two great scientists speaking today. We will start with Alexandra Parouf from Lagos, from University of Toulouse, and she will be presenting for 20 minutes, followed by uh, 10 minutes questions. And afterwards, we'll have Andrew Baba. We will give insights in, in, his, uh, in his latest works for 20 minutes too. So let's start with uh, Alexandra now. Okay, so hi everyone. I'm going to share my screen. Good. So, all good? No, you understand it? Yes, perfect. Go ahead. Oh, okay, sorry. So, hi everyone. So, my name is Alex. Uh, thank you, Boris, for the introduction. So I'm very happy to be here, and I will. Uh, I hope you will like this. Uh, enjoy this presentation. So, as you know, the world's oceans are affected by climate change and human-induced stresses, uh, harmful to ecosystems and ecosystem services. So, to name a few: ocean acidification, plastic pollution, oil spills, and overfishing. Here we're going to focus on two other environmental stresses, global deoxygenation and warming. So here you have uh, vertical sections of four ocean basins, Indian, Atlantic, Southern, and Pacific, of zonal average of temperature trends between 1960 and 2019, between the surface and 2000 meters. Just for one second, okay. So warming is in red and cooling in blue. So all basins are affected by warming, especially at the surface. And there is a particular high penetration of heat in the Atlantic Ocean and Southern Ocean. What about global uh, deoxygenation? So here's a map of uh, historical oxygen trends between 1960 and 2010, based on global oxygen inventories, gain of oxygen in blue, uh, losses of oxygen here in red in micrograms per decades. So the equatorial, uh, North Pacific, Atlantic, and Southern oceans are most affected, and the largest losses occur in the tropical thermocline. Here's an, uh, an illustration of a recent deadly event related to deoxygenation. It's a lobster walkout in South Africa in March 22, so this month. This is the result of oxygen depletion caused by a red tide. So we're going to focus on the impact changes in oxygen and temperature have on the Southeast Pacific. So why the Southeast Pacific? First, it hosts one of the largest oxygen minimum zone, ONZ. Here is a map of the world's ONZ, concentration at minimum depth in micromol. The Southeast Pacific, it's OMZ with hypoxic to suboxic levels of oxygen. This OMZ is associated with an eastern boundary of cooling system and complex systems of currents, the equatorial current system, and the Peru Chile undercurrent responsible for maintaining the ONZ. This OMZ is nonetheless uh, highly productive, it's the first single species fishery in the world, and in Peru, it's 12% of the world's fish landing. It's also subjected to natural variability, mainly the El Nino Southern Oscillation, also known as ENSO. Second, the SEP is also lots of archipelagos due to the presence of ridges and seamounts. You have Juan Fernandez, Desventurada, and Easter Island, uh, associated with network of MPAs, so the green areas. 
These archipelagos is also a high level of biodiversity, endemism, uh, unique ecosystems, but also artisanal fisheries. Two examples here, the Juan Fernandez lobster fishery and spear fishing here in East Island. So what are the projected changes in the site? So two vertical sections at 26 sites of difference in oxygen concentration and temperature between historical and projected values from series and nets, depth, longitude. So for oxygen, the black line represents the mean projected oxygen isocontrol, um, concentration isocontrol in minimal per cubic meter. So 520, 45 representing the ONZ limit. There's mainly a loss of oxygen here in blue, except in the UNZ, and especially at the oxygen level with a gain of more than 20 millimoles per cubic meter. For temperature, only positive changes were at the entire water column, especially at the thermocline level with a gain of 2 to 4 degrees by 2100. So in this context, our questions are, how will oxygen and temperature impact marine habitat? how to characterize the evolution, and how can we use this information to protect marine species from further pressures? To try answering that question, we are going to apply climate velocities to a metabolic index. So what are climate velocities? Climate velocities, they describe how fast an environment is changing. It's the speed and direction of displacement of isotopes. It's calculated as the ratio of the temporal trend to the 2D spatial gradient. So it describes the temporal and spatial dynamic change. Climate velocities have been applied to temperature and it will show that marine species migration were quite consistent with isotherm migration. Here we're going to apply them to a metabolic index. So what is it? The metabolic, the metabolic index phi describes the temperature dependent tolerance to hypoxia of marine organisms. More precisely is the ratio of oxygen supply to demand necessary to sustain metabolic activity at rest. So it depends on two environmental variables, oxygen and temperature. Here is a representation of this relationship. So oxygen demand increases with increasing temperature. Phi is also defined by three terms, two physiological traits, A node, E node. A node is the hypoxic threshold, the inverse of A naught is the minimum oxygen an organism can sustain. E naught is the sensitivity of hypoxia tolerance to temperature. Schematically, is the slope of oxygen demand as a function of temperature. There's a third trait, picket, an ecological trait, which is the ratio of active to resting metabolic rates. So below this threshold, active metabolism cannot be sustained and species cannot populate regions where phi is below. So the three parameters, A node, E node, phi grid, define an ecotype unique to each species. So to calculate climate velocities of the metabolic index, we are going to use a model species with the mean values of all the documented species, as in the Chetal, and also two real species, so the jumbo squid, Dosidicus gigas, uh, endemic of the Eastern Pacific, hypoxia tolerant, and the shrimp, Oplophorus gracilirostris, uh, occupying oxygenated waters. So here's where they stand. So this diagram represents uh, physiological traits. On the y-axis, you have increased hypoxia tolerance, values from 0 to 25. On the x-axis, you have increased sensitivity to temperature, you know, with values ranging from 0 to 0 0.9. In the middle, the model species with mean traits. Here, the squid, hypoxia tolerant, and the shrimp, weakly sensitive to temperature. So as to the model, we are going to use oxygen, temperature, and salinity data from the NPARCS and NETS from CENIC 5, scenario RCP 8.5, years 2006 to 2100. So why are we using this model? Because it simulates uh, best ENSO, a key process in our areas. And for the time periods, we are going to use the mean 2070-2100 for projected PI, mean 1975-2005 for historical PI. Uh, we use 30-year periods to smooth internal variability. And velocities are calculated from 2006 to 2100. 
So now let's look at our results of the projected metabolic index, climate velocities of the metabolic index of our three species at 200 meters. So first, the distribution of the metabolic index for the model species to the left, the jumbo squid in the middle, and the shrimp. The black stars represent Juan Fernandez, Des Venturera, and Easter Island. The white line of the mean projected oxygen concentration isocontour in minimal cubic meter, so 45 for the UMZ limit, 60 for the common hypoxic threshold. The red dashed line represents the mean historical thicket. The black dashed line, the mean projected thicket, so they delimitate viable habitats, so species, species uh, live south of these areas, of these limits. And finally, uh, values range from 0 to 16. So there are three information I want to give you uh, from this figure. Uh, first, the spatial distribution of the metabolic index is comparable across species. So the lowest values are within the OMZ domain, here, here, and here. The index increases with uh, southward. So the spatial distribution of the metabolic index is consistent with oxygen distribution. Second information, the intensity or magnitude of the metabolic index is different uh, between the species. So the jumbo squid has max value of uh, 16, whereas the model species has max value of 6 and 4 for the shrimp. So hypoxia tolerant species like the squid are more sensitive to temperature. And lastly, we are going to look at Fikrit. So I remind you, the red dash line is the main historical Fikrit, the black one is the main projected Fikrit. So there is a stronger change of habitat here for the model species compared to the squid with very tight control and the shrimp. The reason for this is uh, close to the MZ domain, the gradient in phi is very strong. So there is a weak change in metabolic index and in habitat. The further you get from the OMZ, starting with the shrimp and especially the model species, there is a weaker gradient in fire, so a stronger change in habitat. So changes of habitat are proportional to the metabolic index gradient and therefore the oxygen gradient. Okay, so now let's look at climate velocities uh, of the model species first. So here on the left, climate velocities as the ratio of the temporal trend to the 2D spatial gradient. Uh, trends are positive and negative. The dashed line represents the limit between positive and negative velocities or trends. Uh, the, the pink area represents a gain of up to one unit of fire, and the blue area is the loss of up to one unit of fire also uh, by 2100. For the spatial gradient, an area of stronger gradient consistent with oxygen distribution. Uh, this area represents a change of up to one unit of phi per hundreds of kilometers. And the weak gradient area represents a change of maximum 0 0.5 units of phi per hundreds of kilometers. Climate velocities are negative and positive, consistent with the temporal trends. And they are mostly slow velocity, so the remaining area inferred to five kilometers per year over the UMZ domain, or very slow velocities, this area here, where um, well, inferior to one kilometers per year, where the gradient, the spatial gradient dominates the temporal trend. So now, what about real species? So here, same maps for the jumbo squid, and at the bottom for the shrimp. So the jumbo squid, uh, so again, climate velocities, uh, spatial gradient in the middle, temporal term to the right. So the gradients, temporal and spatial of the squid are 10 times higher than those of the shrimp. The reason for this is the high uh, hypoxic tolerance to the high tolerance of, to hypoxia of the squid. They have, however, comparable velocities, except in one area, this area here. So the dashed lines represent uh, the limits between positive and negative velocities, orange for the shrimp, uh, green for the squid. So the shrimp has an extended area of positive velocities compared to the squid. The reason for this is the weak sensitivity to temperature 
of the shrimp, especially when you compare it to the one on the screen. So what happens is the decrease in metabolic index uh, caused by the warming trend does not exceed the increase in metabolic index caused by the simulated reoxygenation of the shrimp. Okay. So now let's look at climate velocities of the three species side by side. So what we see is that they have comparable velocities, so same spatial distribution, same magnitude, uh, and same sign, at the exception of this area. So the dash and still represent the limit between negative and positive velocities, orange, the shrimp, black, the model species, green, the squid. So what it means is that CVFI, CV, uh, climate velocity of the metabolic index, is sensitive to physiological trait, but only weakly. So the implication is that CVFI of the model species is quite representative of real species, and it can be used to give the big picture on how habitat will evolve in broad areas. Now, so what? How do we characterize habitat change based on velocities and five? So one way to do it is to group them as safe and at risk areas. So safe areas or areas of positive velocities, it means a potential gain of habitat or more breathable habitat. Areas of high fees, so far from fictive. And areas of slow velocities, whether they are negative or positive, positive and here with an arbitrary limit of one kilometers per year. So two important points of discussion here. So slow velocity doesn't mean it's negligible. So habitat could still be displaced uh, beyond reasonable distances. Think, for example, of artisanal fisheries in Juan Bay. The second point is the challenge is to define meaningful ecological uh, thresholds on which criteria um, could be different and, oops, sorry, dependent on context, the species you're looking at, the, the, the habitat you're looking at, et cetera, et cetera. So it needs to be defined firsthand. So now areas at risk. So areas of negative velocity, so a decrease in metabolic index, especially when superimposed to high gradient area, meaning a rapid spatial transition to less favorable conditions. So that the case of quantum index. Also, uh, areas where species uh, occupy a uh, region close to 50. So if there were species here, they would have to move south by 2100, for example. And lastly, the transition area between positive and negative velocities represented by the dashed envelope here, so inside of it, which is due to model natural variability, uncertainty in the trends or sensitivity to temperature. Okay, so now let's sum up the take home messages. So what I wanted to show you is that words, is that uh, fee is different across species. So they have, they may have comparable spatial patterns uh, because of the sensitivity to oxygen distribution, but they have very different magnitude or intensity of the index uh, and very different thickets. Uh, climate velocities of the metabolic index are, however, very comparable across species, the considered species, so same sign, pattern, and magnitude. And they are only weakly sensitive to physio physiological traits, which is the interesting part. Uh, PICRIT uh, gives precious information regarding the limit of geographical variable habitat. It's species specific. Unfortunately, unfortunately its values for different species and uncertainty is not uh, it's quite poorly documented. So the main info here will be that um, CV climate velocities of the metabolic index uh, of the model species is quite representative of uh, other species, and therefore it can give the big picture on how habitat will uh, evolve and displace. It's a robust metric. It can give can help us identifying uh, safe and at risk areas. So for future work, we are going to look at more specific species. So the Juan Fernandez lobster, and also two pelagic fishes, Corinoba and Palometa, uh, of interest for aquacultures, and possibly the sea urchin of Juan Fernandez, which is invasive, 
and a predator to the lobster, so endangering this fishery. We'll also look at the aerobic growth index um, for, because it seems that the traits needed for this index are, uh, are easier to measure and also more species are documented um, present. And lastly, I'll finish with the idea that CVFI, I think, has great potential to help design marine protected areas. It's a nature-based solution, and it would be a powerful tool to help proactive marine conservation. All right, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Alexandra, for, for this presentation, nice presentation. So we have, uh, in principle, we have 10 minutes for questions before um, Andrew's presentation. So does anyone have a, have a question to Alexandra? Let me see the chat. You can put your question in the question box or in the chat. So maybe maybe I can ask a uh, yes, go ahead. There is one now from Christoph too, actually. They are popping in. Ah, okay. They are coming. Okay, so uh, a question from uh, Christophe uh, Rabouille. Over the historical time, uh, 80 to the 2020, have there been any reports of uh, species migration in the data from fisheries? Do we know about that? So historical migration, like up to recently? Yes, uh, yeah. the last, the last uh, three decades. Mm. Yeah, uh, species are moving actually northward. They are uh, um, escaping uh, mid-latitude regions as a result of temperature, but it wasn't documented uh, if they were escaping oxygen losses or, or losses calculated with metabolic index. So they are moving, yeah, to the poles, to cooler waters. Okay, a, a question from Mark Wells. Uh, so very nice talk. One of the big uncertainty of, of course is the ability of organisms to adapt to changes. Mm -hmm. We don't know that, but your yes. modeling might provide an indication of what rate amount of adaptation would be needed in your model for the organisms to do well. Yes, exactly. That would be, uh, that would be the, the doing it the other way around. Um, well, it's been, it's believed that uh, species adaptation uh, would be easier for long, for species who live long, so more than a year or, or so. But uh, yeah, it would tell us how, so exactly what you said, it would tell us how long they have to adapt if they can't move away. The, the, the principal, Adaptation would be to live, but if they can't, it will tell us how long they have to adapt. Yeah. Don't know if that makes yes. sense. Yes, I think it makes sense. A question from Andreas. Do vertical oxygen gradients matter for climate velocity as well? Uh, yes, uh, we showed that, um, well, the gradients or what, okay, how can I put this? So the metabolic index is uh, highly sensitive to oxygen and temperature gradient, and you find the same relationship for, for climate velocities because it's dependent on the distribution of the metabolic index and the trend. So same effect uh, on climate velocities, yes. So what, you, what I can add is that on, on the upper 200 meters, both the oxygen and temperature that matters, and below 200 meters, the, the effect of oxygen is way more important than the one of temperature. Okay. Uh, we can take the question by uh, Lisa Levin. Can climate velocity uh, of uh, metabolic index document potential for vertical habitat compression as well as horizontal changes? Yeah, we could calculate the vertical velocities. Um, so yeah, we could do the same, but vertically. 
but what you you have to will you will have to consider all the points is that will species be able to, to to go deeper? Some species cannot. So yeah. Okay. Any other question? I have I have a question myself. Uh, could yes. you could you comment on uncertainties of the climate velocity for um, uh, the metabolic index uh, as a function of the uncertainties on trends in temperature versus trend in oxygen, for example? Uh, so the uncertainty caused by trend temperature trends is very slow, uh, low because the uncertainty in the temperature trends are very slow. Low. But for oxygen, this is the envelope I showed. So can I, I'm going to share. Uh, do you see it enough here? Maybe. Yeah, we can see. Uh, it. Enough. Uh, the top. Maybe a bit bigger. So this envelope here, it it gives the uncertainty in oxygen. So if you were looking at temperature, the this envelope would be much more uh, narrow, or and I think it would be in a different area also. Um, so, yeah. Okay. So, do we have, do we have uh, another question? If we don't, I suggest we pass on to Andrew's uh, presentation. So, uh, Andrew, uh, Andrew Babin uh, <coughs> will present his work now. Are you, are you there, Andrew? Yes. Okay. So please, uh, please go ahead. Okay. Um, it is lovely to to kind of see everyone. Um, we're getting better in COVID. At least I, you know, don't have a mask on at the moment. Um, it's a pleasure to um, be here and talk about a little bit of our, our recent work, and specifically in this capacity, looking at the extent um, and size of these oxygen deficient zones in the Eastern Tropical Pacific. And I have to thank Alex for giving me an excellent uh, introduction um, so that hopefully I can skip over a few little details uh, that she had already presented. I will say that I do very little myself. Uh, this was all this this project was really executed by an undergraduate student at MIT working with me, Jared Kwasinski. Um, he's now a, a PhD student at Caltech, but uh, nothing that I show here could have been accomplished without him. And so he really is the primary author on this, and I'm just the the mouthpiece in some way. Um, in essence, I just want to set the stage a little bit. The dominant metabolisms that people seem to, to care about on our planet are, of course, photosynthesis. That's this um, conversion of carbon dioxide, water, some nitrogen source, a phosphate, use some light, and make a phytoplankton of some sort, here represented by the beautiful Emiliani Huxleyi, but that is by no means the only organism of note. And a byproduct of this is, of course, splitting of water and making oxygen, at least in the recent two and a half billion years or so of Earth's history. That all takes place pretty much at the surface where you have enough light. But then um, as this organic matter, these, these phytoplankton cells or some derivative product therein of some kind of zooplankton, um, aggregate, fecal pellets, et cetera, as this sinks into the interior, the reverse process happens, and that is that heterotrophs consume this oxygen um, to, you know, they respire this organic carbon back to these inorganic nutrient forms. And we indeed see this when we look at chemical profiles of oxygen. And so on the left, I'm showing a, a profile of, of oxygen saturation here at the Hawaiian Ocean Time Series Station Aloha. Um, and so more or less, the surface is in equilibrium with the atmosphere. You have 100% oxygen saturation. And then it gets drawn down as the you move deeper into the water column, which is an effect of net respiration. 
at some point it comes back up due to ventilation um, from cold oxygen rich polar waters. But you see here a beautiful minimum in oxygen. Here it's about 10% saturation at about 700 meters. Um, and so that's what we would call an oxygen minimum zone. Um, on the right, I'm actually showing a map of oxygen saturation at about 200 meters in depth, which is semi-arbitrary. Um, but you can see that the, the central ocean gyres typically have a lot more oxygen. These are lower productivity. Um, but in the Eastern Tropical Pacific, so here in the Eastern Tropical North Pacific, off of Mexico, Costa Rica, upwelling zone, um, you have the Eastern Tropical South Pacific off of Peru, Chile. You have the, the Northern Indian Ocean and the Arabian Sea and Bay of Bengal. And this is where you see these really blue, very oxygen depleted waters. And so if I were to just move a few thousand kilometers or so east in the Pacific from Hawaii and enter the Eastern Tropical North Pacific, you see a similar uh, profile, but with some notable differences. First is that this oxygen gradient, this oxycline is much shallower in the water column. And that has to do with differences in the amount of productivity in these waters, but also due to differences in stratification. Further, the oxygen concentration itself is much lower. Um, for you and me, 10%, 0% are fairly similar in that we wouldn't do well in either. Same with most fish species. Um, Alex knows a lot more about that than I do. Um, but here you have very, very low oxygen, uh, so low that some really exciting processes uh, can take place, which I will talk about in a couple slides. But what you can see is that there's this swath of water a few hundred meters or so thick where the oxygen levels are barely detectable. Um, and so more or less this talk will be about, well, what is that detectability? What, do, what does that mean? Um, to just show this in uh, another uh, way, this is a, a very nice figure published by Strama et al. Um, you can see these, these zones of very, very low oxygen. Here it's in purple. Um, in the Northern uh, Indian Ocean, and as well as the Eastern Tropical Pacific. But here you can see some contours. This is now in, in absolute concentration, micromoles per kilogram. And you can see this contour of around 10. Um, I'm going to say that we don't think that it's 10. There are a number of people on this webinar who, who absolutely measure uh, these concentrations to beautifully low values. And instead of being about 10 micromoles per kilogram, it might be closer to 10 nanomoles per kilogram or three orders of magnitude lower than what is typically able to be reported by conventional means. And so there's a disconnect between what the absolute concentrations that are measurable are and what the true value at depth is. And so this is where we're going to try to understand what uh, does this oxygen deficient water look like without trying to, to pick a specific concentration to, to demarcate what that value is. I hope that makes sense. And the reason why people care about this so much is because it's in these oxygen deficient zones that when microorganisms, bacteria mostly, but not exclusively, get strapped for oxygen, when uh, most other life would just simply suffocate, they're able to, to utilize a diverse set of metabolisms that they have and instead turn to the next best source, this next best oxidant for organic matter. And in this case, in the ocean, it's nitrate, so NO3 minus. And indeed, when oxygen concentrations become limiting, these organisms are able to reduce nitrate to nitrite, to nitric oxide, to nitrous oxide, to dinitrogen gas. Um, and this is a, a pathway called denitrification. The products of this are, are quite spectacular and quite important for climate, uh, which I will talk about in a, in a little bit. But the question really is, how low is low? Uh, because if we're trying to understand the ocean volume that is 10 micromolar, one micromolar, 100 nanomolar, different, different concentrations, and we try to ascribe that this denitrification process only takes place when oxygen is below some threshold, well, we kind of have to know something about what these concentrations are in order to make better predictions, better models uh, that can reproduce kind of these observations. 
And so here I'm showing uh, now a, a profile um, that we had collected on a cruise in the Eastern Tropical North Pacific off of Mexico. And so here I'm showing in, in the big, the, the full ocean uh, profile, the, the full column of about 20, uh, sorry, 3,800 meters or so at this location. The gray is a continuous oxygen trace or a semi-continuous oxygen trace that's measured with an electrode sensor. The uh, green dots are uh, bottle concentrations from a Winkler titration um, in essence. And what you can see is if you were to only report the green dots, they don't perfectly capture the shape of this oxygen deficient zone. You can more or less see that best in this um, inset where you can see that the points pretty much line up. But if you were to try to connect these dots, you don't really get this steep, beautiful gradient unless you were to sample pretty much meter by meter within that layer. And that's just very much impractical. And so we're starting to try to take use of this more continuous trace um, that we can, can get from a, a continuous sensor. The orange lines um, is actually what would happen if you were to grid these bottle data on some standard gridding method. In this case, we, we picked one of the World Ocean Atlas um, uh, depth grids. But you can see that when this gets reported then in this kind of global gridded database, what the reality, um, so this, this gray line, doesn't really match what, what ends up being reported in these, these gridded data products particularly at very steep gradients. And so this is this oxycline, the, this, this steep vertical gradient in oxygen that exists at the top of the ODC. And so that's what we're, we're going to try to resolve. What is the depth of onset, for instance, of anoxia, whether it's 100 meters in this case versus 125 or so meters if you were to have gridded this separately. And that might seem like a bit of a difference or not much of a difference, but given that fish, uh, their habitats get compressed um, based on what the specific oxygen concentration is, knowing what these depths are, it can be very important. There are pretty much two major um, ways of, of measuring oxygen uh, within the, the depths of the ocean. One is using these, these CTD packages on the left. So in addition to these bottles that can collect water from a specific depth, there are continuous sensors um, at the bottom of this, this package here uh, that are continuously measuring things like oxygen. The other are some more autonomous methods like Argo floats, but not exclusively Argo floats, um, where these will drift around the ocean um, in a Grangian fashion and measure an oxygen profile every 10 days or so. Um, these are each equipped with slightly different um, types of sensors, which I can go into, but, but in the interest of time, I'm skipping over right now. Um, but they're able to report back these continuous profiles or semi-continuous profiles. Um, one of the things that we ran into a, a difficulty wise was that most CTD data are reported back into these global repositories in one or two meter resolution, which is quite nice. Argo data are typically recorded at a much lower resolution, um, pretty much in order to conserve the bandwidth that's required to communicate with the satellite and beam the data back. And so one of the issues that we have run into is just how much of a vertical resolution can we have, given that many of these Argo data may have only reported 20 or 50 meter resolution um, within their profiles. And one of the things that, that we often see within the, the data that, that we see at, at sea is that the minimum value that's reported by some of these sensors is semi-arbitrary. And so here I'm showing uh, two profiles, um, or actually one profile, but measured in two different ways. And this was measured by uh, Niels Peter Rebsbeck's group um, in Denmark by Laura Tiano, Emilio um, Garcia. Um, and what you can see is that the stocks electrode, the switchable trace oxygen electrode, which really is this gold standard at, at this point of how low can a sensor measure, 
is, is really measuring zero or, or approximately zero on this scale. It's probably something like two to 10 nanomolar or nanomoles per kilogram in concentration. But the electrode that's mounted on the, the CTD package, the Seabird sensor, is measuring a minimum of around one micromole per kilogram. Uh, that's, you know, not bad, uh, but there's a dramatic difference between the two. Um, and this is where a lot of people will potentially set some cutoff and say anything lower than 10 or five micromoles per kilogram, they'll call oxygen deficient. And we're trying to get away from having to define this and instead utilize a, a different method. One reason why that's been problematic for us is that I'm showing one profile here of about one micromole per kilogram as a, a minimum, but I've been on cruises where that might've been 0.5, it might've been five, one cruise it was negative six. Um, and so that is a, a fairly uh, uh, arbitrary distinction. And it just comes from the fact that it's very hard to calibrate and maintain a calibration at these minuscule concentrations that exist. But the key feature between both of these profiles is the vertical gradient. Both pretty much have no gradient in oxygen at these oxygen deficient depths. And that's because it's almost impossible to maintain a gradient if you have zero and you have no ability to, to produce any oxygen or consume any because you're a few hundred meters away from your next oxygen source. And so that's the key distinction that uh, we try to make in our analysis. Further, these oxygen deficient zones are crucial for climate and sustainability. Um, one aspect is that, as I said, this is where denitrification happens. Here I'm showing the nitrogen deficit or some, some indicator of the fact that nitrogen, nitrate, was lost relative to another nutrient, phosphate, in the water. And you can see in the Eastern Tropical North and South Pacific, the Arabian Sea, that this very much exists. These are these deep purple colors that indicate, yes, this is a zone where this fertilizer was consumed not for biomass, not to make it a protein, but rather for energy. Um, you can also see, um, I plotted the, the stations that went into making this map in GLODAP on here very nicely. So as you can see, the data are sparse. You have these uh, beautiful transects. Um, this is this one that I'm highlighting is the P18 WOS line, the World Ocean Circulation Experiment. And you have a, a set and series of these. But the vast majority of the ocean is not well captured in the data that, that comprise this data product. And so we're actually trying to expand beyond that, which I'll show. In addition to being these regions where you consume this fertilizer, which restricts the fertility of the ocean. These are also zones where nitrous oxide, this, this potent greenhouse gas, about 300 times more powerful than carbon dioxide, and also an agent of stratospheric ozone loss is produced. And so here I'm showing two contour lines of oxygen, the 10% and 20% saturation horizon and a um, uh, density surface of 26 and a half. But you can see that it's these regions, glowing red, where the amount of nitrous oxide in the air that transits above them is very high. It's anom anomalously high compared to the rest of the South Pacific, which is lower than average. And so these zones are really acting to as a net source of this greenhouse gas. And resolving their spatial extent, their structure, is important and indeed for understanding the dynamics of nitrous oxide moving forward. In addition, we see that uh, there is a, a signal that exists with El Niños and La Niñas. Um, and so I don't want to go into this figure too, too much, which I apologize for. But in essence, the ODZs are this lowest box here between 0 and 10% saturation. You see these are the where you end up having the most amount of, of N2O um, and as measured in the, the Central Pacific. And this is modified higher during a La Nina and it's curtailed during an El Nino. And this is very much linked with the dynamics that lead to the uh, rise of, of these zones in the first place. In addition, these zones underlie some of the most productive fisheries on the planet. Um, here I'm showing uh, from the World Bank some uh, fishery production from 2018. And between Peru and Chile, they're 
taking around 10 million tons of fish out of the, the ocean. The vast majority of it is pelagic fish, um, which are thriving there because of the, the same reasons that the ODZs are there. That is, you have this intense upwelling that fuels algal production, fuels then secondary production, fuels fisheries. But as this organic matter sinks at depth, you end up having this oxygen deficient water. And indeed, the oxygen deficient waters act to compress the habitat of these pelagic fish very close to the surface. They can't transit typically through this swath of zero oxygen water. They have to maintain themselves in the upper 50, 100 meters or so. Not exclusively, though, as Alex pointed out, with particularly things like squid. Further, the ODZs may expand um, due to things like uh, temperature, but there's a potential that they could contract as well. Um, and so there's a sign change difference that we have not yet resolved as climate changes as to whether these zones will get bigger, uh, which will then lead to more nitrogen loss, potentially more uh, N2O production, more fishery, um, uh, habitat compression, or they may contract, um, which would be the, the opposite of that. And this is due to the fact that the oceans are warming, warmer water holds less gas. It also has to do with the fact that there's increased stratification, which indeed would, would curtail some of that upwelling, curtail some of the fishery production, and may in fact lead to a, a contraction of, of these oxygen deficient zones. This is the, the sign change difference. But there's also modified ventilation. This is both in terms of global circulation, but also in terms of uh, transient eddies um, that act to supply oxygen laterally into these zones. There's additionally anticipated changes with El Nino and La Nina cycles, which will impact the ODZs. And there's eutrophication, particularly on, along the coast, when you have runoff from the continent, uh, reaching the ocean and, and stimulating a localized flow. And so all of these, these anthropogenic impacts that we as society uh, make on the ocean will have dramatic changes to the overall oxygen structure, as long as we know what that is. And so really, we really want to know what the oxygen deficient zones look like now, but also into the future. And so uh, Jarek and I published this paper a few months ago. Um, which you can, can read um, at your leisure. Um, but I also want to point out a, a, a complimentary paper that was published the same week by a number of the people participating in this webinar, uh, which provided this global framework uh, for reporting oxygen, creating these, these global data sets. And so what we did was we assembled sensor data, about 25,000 profiles um, spanning 15 million measurements in the region. Uh, we looked at them to identify the, the oxygen uh, gradient uh, with depth, defining now the ODZ core. You can see actually in this profile, the, the minimum absolute concentration is not zero, but uh, that's measured, but in reality it is. And then we mapped this, this data product um, that is now freely available in these half degree resolution and in a, a vertical depth coordinate of 20 decibars and in a vertical um, density coordinate of 0.1 sigma theta units. We further defined a fraction ODZ um, or FODZ, which is a metric that we, we use to take in uh, advantage of the fact that a lot of these profiles happen at the same point in space. And so we have many data um, from any one of these grid cells, and we don't need to define whether it's yes or no, but also how frequently is it yes or no. And so that's what we mean by this fraction ODC. And then here's some of the data. Um, I won't go into it too, too much, but we can see in depth space that the, at the very shallowest, you will really only have the ODZ appearing um, along the coast. Here's Manzanillo, Mexico. Um, and then as you get deeper, the ODZ is expand. Um, and then the Eastern Tropical North Pacific actually extends much deeper than the Eastern Tropical South Pacific does. In addition, we can see uh, the depth and density of the top of the ODZ, um, which is uh, indeed um, shallower, closer to, to shore. Um, this in essence acts in some fashion like what is that 
that vertical depth limit that a fish can, can migrate through. We can see the differences in thickness. Um, here on the left, I'm showing the, the raw data, and on the right, a um, uh, gridded product using uh, DIVA interpolation. Uh, and you can indeed see the, the Eastern Tropical North Pacific is both um, larger as well as deeper compared to the South Pacific. Um, now, this is, is showing the maximal extent on the left of panel A of the ODZs, and you can see just how intense and, and beautiful they are. There's actually some subgrid structure that exists here. Um, and you can see the, the maximal aerial extent as well as a function of depth, and the ETNP does extend um, further, and its maximal extent is in fact deeper, around 500 decibars versus around 300 for the Eastern Tropical South Pacific. But we're not the first to, to have tried to do this. Um, one of the, the papers that Alex had cited or showed a figure from earlier, the Palmier and Ruiz Pino um, study, um, has been this canonical paper that, that you know, we've been thinking about. And they defined this, this oxygen minimum around 20, uh, 20 micromoles per kilogram and ended up with uh, you know, a, a, a good metric, a good estimate, but with a little bit of error or uncertainty. Um, in it, and that's due to pretty much the, the data product that, that um, was used in order to complete these studies. Uh, Daniele Bianchi and his group, um, this was when, when Daniele was a student with Jorge Sarmiento, um, did a similar study and also found similar numbers, but it depended on whether they used 20 micromolar threshold or 5 micromolar threshold. Here we find a similar volume, somewhere around five to six times 10 to the fifth cubic kilometers for the ETSP and about two times 10 to the sixth cubic kilometers for the ETNP. But the, the spread, the error, um, we've been able to reduce a lot through our, our um, study. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip over a lot, um, but you do see that the ETNP, this is now a, a meridional transect um, through the the Eastern Tropical North and South Pacific. You see, the ETNP actually has a large anoxic core, whereas the ETSP sees more of this transient anoxia. We further can use this data set to look for these oxygen intrusions. So this is like a, a wedge of oxygen water slowly percolating into the, the interior of the, the ODZ, and we defined a rate or uh, an incidence of this. And we are able to see that there are differences based on where you are. Don't treat these oxygen deficient zones as one box. It depends whether you're more poleward, um, that's the, the teal and, and red colors, or more equatorward, uh, I'm sorry, that's the opposite, more equatorward, which is the teal and red, versus more poleward, which is these gray colors, in terms of how the, the um, water is being ventilated. And we relate this to, to eddies uh, predominantly, that as you get closer to the equator, you have a lot of these eddies um, uh, that are able to mix oxygen into the water itself. And so how these ODZs change will have far reaching impacts on things like fisheries and nitrous oxide, um, but who knows? And this is where we're hopeful that our data set can be utilized as a, a baseline against which to compare future studies. And so with that, I will thank you all for your time um, and answer any questions that I have in time remaining. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew, for, for this very nice presentation. So I'm, I suppose we have, uh, we have questions for you. So let's start with uh, the question by uh, Yung Yu Lim. Could you introduce a, a bit detail for Enzo and two whole connections. So uh, ab absolutely. So in essence, when an El Nino uh, during an El Nino year, you deepen the thermocline in the Eastern Pacific, which curtails upwelling. When you have this curtailed upwelling, you have a pretty much collapse of these fisheries. This is in fact why these zones are named El Nino, um, because this is an observation that typically happened around Christmas. Um, and in Spanish, El Nino uh, means the child. Um, when you have a collapse of fisheries, you have a collapse of the amount of organic material that's descending into depth, um, and then the biological oxygen demand. Um, and so the oxygen deficient zones will in fact contract. You end up having more oxygen in these waters. 
when you have more oxygen, uh, you actually end up creating less nitrous oxide because you have less denitrification and also less uh, nitrogen uh, nitrification as well. The reverse happens during a La Nina. Okay, thank you. So we'll take a question uh, from Mark Wells. The factor driving this OMZ obviously are important to understand. Can you explain the underlying reason for the marked asymmetry in distribution of the oxygen in the zone north and south of the equator and why it extends so much further westward north of the equator? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and it's un, it's not perfectly resolved yet. But the, the geography of the continents undoubtedly plays a, a role, as does the fact that both water masses are pretty much ventilated by subantarctic mode waters. And so um, just the, the ways that the ocean is circulating um, leads to these differences in ventilation rates um, and leads to um, just, just a, a lot of, of these, these differences, this asymmetry north and south. Similar things, patterns of winds, et cetera. Um, and so it, it's really the structure of continents and water. Okay, thank you. We have a question by Andreas, Andreas Sochli. Presumably, you, you have to map all data into a single climatology, as also done in previous uh, studies. To what extent could, you differ, could the differences in the estimated uh, ODZ volumes be caused by different data sets taken at different times on the global deoxygenation trend? Do you think there is a change to use your method to generate maps of oxygen distribution and the change over time? Decade, decade of maps? I hope so, or I hope you will be able to do that uh, more, more precisely. Um, so absolutely, these, these global climatologies, just trying to collect off across decades, assemble everything together in order to come up with a best guess is fraught with error when you have a, a trend, uh, a long-term trend across those years as well. Um, and so, but I don't think that that's what particularly relates to some of the, the um, differences in the estimated volumes per se. I think the, the driver typically is what one uses as a threshold value for defining what your oxygen minimum or oxygen deficiency is. Our hope very much is that people will continue to add to this kind of data set um, in order to um, in, in order to make it better and, and in order to, to continue going. Um, and if we do so, if we have enough data, we can start thinking about things like uh, decadal variability, ENSO variability, et cetera. We tried to do this. There wasn't enough data, um, even within this study, to try to resolve um, a decadal or a seasonal um, or interannual cycle. Okay, thank you. So uh, uh, a question by Christophe Rabouille who congratulates you for your presentation. Do you have a metrics for intercepts of the anoxic layer with the sediments? This would be interesting for benthic habitats and vegetal cycle in the sediment. Yeah, that, that's a, another excellent point. We did not, um, but one could of course um, coordinate this map. Um, the, the product is available as an, uh, a net CDF file. Um, and so you can co coordinate that with benthic uh, topography uh, in order to, to figure this out. And when you have anoxic layer water intersecting sediments, you can actually uh, end up supplying a lot of, of different trace nutrients, metals uh, in particular, to that water. And it can then can act to, to help with productivity um, in any forms. And so the, doing something like that would be a, a great strategy. A question by Aurélien Paulmier. If you want to characterize further the ODZ, not only the ODZ core, but the upper and lower boundaries, what about to characterize the intensity of the O2 gradient in micromol kilogram per meter? Uh, absolutely. And so um, Aurelion is, is um, showing that if we didn't just look at where is the vertical gradient close enough to zero, but rather what is the maximal gradient or the maximal local gradient. You could actually start characterizing the, the two oxyclines, that upper one, which is much, much steeper, and that lower one as well. Um, and Wes, we absolutely could do that. Um, someone can do that. Uh, that would be excellent to do. Uh, it was just, uh, we didn't end up doing this in this study, mostly because we wanted to focus on where is the anoxia, 
um, itself. And so we characterized the, the top of the ODZ, which is the bottom of that upper oxycline. Um, and that, that's in essence the, the um, limit that we were looking at. One could also look at the difference um, between say the surface ocean, which is fairly homogenized because of wind mixing, um, and the onset of that, uh, that steep decline of oxygen in order to resolve what the top of the oxycline is. Uh, but again, that's not something that we uh, tried to do. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, uh, a, a question, uh, one question uh, from, um, from a Frank Miller Kager. I was wondering how we characterize the statement commonly made by a lot of people that the ocean are desoxygenating, given the data shown here, lots of gap uncertainty, etc., so that the public can understand what is really happening and how we can plan ecological observing. Yeah, no, it's a good question, but I, there is pretty much a, a, a consensus that the oceans on a whole are losing oxygen, and that's primarily driven by temperature changes. And this is where I make the distinction between an oxygen minimum zone, which might be more um, important for things like fisheries and ecological planning compared to an oxygen deficient zone, which would be uh, potentially more important for climate um, because it's in the deficient zones that you end up consuming this fertilizer and creating nitrous oxide. But it's in the minimum zones that you end up having greater impacts on uh, macrofauna. Uh, they don't care if the oxygen is 10% saturated or zero, they can't survive. And so the, that's where I, I make these distinctions. But on a whole, there will be more hypoxic waters, absolutely. The oxygen minimums will get closer to the surface. I don't wanna say absolutely, but almost certainly. Um, and the, it will require that knowledge to better plan ecologically, to better manage fisheries, to know what the, the habitat in fact looks like. Okay, thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, I guess we will, uh, we will uh, close the session now. And so I thank you. I thank you a lot for your active participation. And, and before, before closing, I would like to to invite everybody to join uh, the 53 International Colloquium on Ocean Dynamics, uh, joined with the, with the GONTU Oxygen Conference that would take place in May, 1620 of May. And uh, today is the last day, is the last day for, uh, for, uh, for sending abstract. So uh, now, so we are looking to, we are good for us to welcome you again in April for the next session of the webinar. And uh, the exact date and topic will be announced uh, shortly. Thank you again to the speakers and to the participants and uh, have a nice day. Bye-bye.